very generous expenses. Um, it was there also to police it, but really it was about a culture of service to MPs, and that's, that's how my staff operated. I suppose Emma, that, that was part of the way the Commons operated in that era. There were members at the top of the pyramid there and the whole organisation existed to serve them. And, and that was what, I suppose, was driving the whole thing. It was reflective of wider society as well. It, in some ways, Parliament is, is obviously a sort of microcosm of society. And, you know, even sort of 15, 20 years ago, British society expected organisations to be much more private, even public organisations. And so it was acceptable in those days, I think, to be much, much less transparent and to keep certain things private. And, and MPs certainly expected uh, to have some kind of privacy, certainly about their private lives and, for example, about where they lived. So I think, I think privacy was very different. And I think you're right, there was a culture of deference again, in wider society, but, but it showed up in the House of Commons. So I think that that's certainly partly why this crisis unfolded, because it was the beginning of, of a quite fast transition. And you, you described, Andrew, that the system has been very generous, and, and that almost understates it, doesn't it? I mean, this is in you know, self-certified expenses. You didn't need receipts unless the amount was above a certain level. And a whole load of things that most people would expect to pay for out of their wages were provided in addition to those wages, even food. Of course, uh, and MPs uh, felt that they had to live in two places at once. Increasingly, they were having to spend more and more time in the constituencies. And uh, to make it affordable, then the expenses started to grow so that they could live uh, in two places at once. And j just cutting back to the thought about privacy, there was the, a sense back in the late 1990s and early 2000s that this was really nobody else's business. So we are Parliament. We're above the Constitution almost. Uh, we need to be properly looked after. And yes, of course, we're honourable members. And the phrase honourable member was commonly used to say, you're not really there to question me because I'm honourable, I'm trustworthy. And so self-certification was the core of the system. That's how it worked. But the problem with that was when it became clear the extent to which honourable members were not being entirely honourable. I mean, looking back at it now, do you think that maybe you, as the, as the official in charge of all this, presiding over it, should perhaps have been trying to police it more rigorously, double-check things, tighten the rules? And we did. Uh, uh, as far as we could, but the culture then was rather against that. Was there the thought there, Emma, that it was always politically difficult to increase MPs' pay? There was always a furore if there was any sort of big quantum leap in, in what they received in their wages. But there was this kind of subliminal message out there, there's, there's a very generous expenses system, so fill your boots. It wasn't subliminal. subliminal. It was absolutely uh, articulated uh, out loud by, by the whips and it it goes back a long way uh, and it, it does indicate a kind of cowardice really um, in that the party leaders could have agreed to accept the recommendations of the, the senior salaries board, wasn't it, would yeah. say mm -hmm. MPs are falling behind, they should have a, a pay rise and it was the party leaders and, and the whips who said no, that wouldn't play well with the public but don't worry, you'll have generous uh, expenses, but also generous pensions, so, so people didn't, didn't notice the generosity of the pensions so much. And I think it is really important to distinguish this kind of generosity which was compensating for pay. And of course, they were, you know, well paid relative to the average, but I think the difficulty uh, about underpaying MPs is that the consequences are very severe for all of us. You need in a democratic uh, system to have really a, a, a really good representation of the population in that parliament. So you really have to pay them enough so that no one is put off. So it's all very well for people who might have another income, for example, if the pay's, you know, not that high. But for those who don't have another income and have to live in two places, you, you, have, to, you have to be careful not to put those those people off. There's a distinction, if you like, between the kind of mortal and venial sins of expenses. <laughs> there were people who were uh, you know, trying to get 
what they felt they were being offered in, in, within the rules. And then there were people who were engaged in, you know, the technical term that they have in the legal profession is it, for this is fraud uh, and, were, you know, faking documents and whatever to get the money. And, so, and several of them went to prison. But I mean, around all this, while all this was going on, suddenly there were barbarians at the gates I, I, in the shape of journalists uh, armed with the Freedom of Information Act trying to get hold of the information That's to see right. what the MPs were getting. And, and that, I think, caused a certain amount of institutional panic, Andrew. It, it really did. And, and it started before the Info in, uh, Freedom of Information Act became law. So, uh, uh, sorry, before it came into effect. It became law in 2000. It didn't come into effect till 2005. So there was four years plus to prepare for it. But towards 2005, the media were revving up, not just on Parliament, but on, on various aspects of government as well. And Parliament decided it would publish uh, expenses in 2004 to try and draw the sting, as it were. That turns out to have been a misjudgment, because in late 2004, when all of that information was published, sort of summary tables and so on, um, the way it was released and the information itself just led the media to say, you've not told us enough. Just whetted the appetites. It really, really did. So that in early 2005, as soon as they could, various journalists started asking very detailed questions, give us more, give us more. And that almost immediately started legal processes going, which led to court appearances in 2000 and when was it, six, seven... And eight. And you were one of those making appearances before all tribunals and so forth um, about all this. Sadly, yes, because um, we lost every single tribunal case that came up um, and lost big time. Parliament tried to pull up the drawbridge, didn't it, and try to find out its own ways of protecting itself from all this, and none of them worked. Yes, it's a very contradictory story. I mean, one of the aspects of, of what looks like it well, was idiocy, really, was that that the the um, MPs thought that once they'd passed the Freedom of Information Act, that they could exempt themselves, and so in a way, it's it's amazing that they thought that the public would uh, tolerate the idea that everybody else has to be transparent about information, but that they can keep information about their own expenditure secret. So there's that position might, one might want to take. But at the same time, if you look at it from their point of view, what were they, one of the aspects that they were really worried about was details about their homes, um, about anything to do with their family being exposed. And of course now that we have various really scary stories like the murder of Joe Cox, we can see why they might be worried about security. And but, in a... but at the same time, there, were, there was a reason too for the sheer level of embarrassment about some of the claims that were being made. When you, I, and the, the, the one that always used to get me was the MP who objected to Artex ceilings and wanted, wanted the taxpayer essentially to pay to have her ceilings redone. Uh, but there were plenty of others, so some, of, some of them perhaps not entirely accurate about you know, duck islands and moat clearing and things which aren't quite as sometimes reported. But this was almost an extinction level event. This was an asteroid striking the closed mm. ecosystem of Westminster. And, and it threw people into a sense of doom and gibbering panic. It's, uh, and this is really interesting, Mark, because right back in 2001, long, long time before this all broke, but when it was clear that things were at some point going to come out, MPs voted for themselves a very big increase in their second homes allowance. 42% it went up. And that enabled them to start claiming for all sorts of extra things. So. The money they'd already got was enough to pay for the homes that they'd then got. So what were they going to do with the extra, whatever it was, £6,000? So they wanted Artex ceilings removed, they wanted new TVs, they wanted this and that, duck, duck houses and moat clearing and all the rest of it, which wouldn't have been possible before then. So at the very time the writing was on the wall, there was more and more they could claim. And when, of course, it started to be revealed in the second half of the 2000s, the historical records went back to the very moment they'd voted themselves that big increase. Mm. And so it seemed to ordinary people, why are MPs claiming for all of these things that I have to pay my own hard-earned uh, money? And Emma, what was get? the impact on MPs of all this? And they were caught with their fingers in the cookie jar to some extent, some of them at least. Yes, oh, absolutely devastating. Um, MPs 
told me many times that the, the stories about expenses were more devastating to them than any other sort of public exposure that they, that they experienced. I mean, even those who, ha who, who had to suffer reports about divorce or, or you know, embarrassing affairs, nothing compared to being alleged to have, have lied about expenses. That sort of, you know, the honourable member is really under question. And even the uh, blameless ones, indeed. Yes, right. I was going to say, and of course yeah. some were criminal and, as you say, went to prison. Others did suffer sort of injustices. I mean, the, the, the duck house, which, of course, is the iconic image of the expenses scandal, turns out not to have actually been even a claim. So it certainly wasn't paid. Um, but actually, it was a case of an MP who uh, had such high expenses on his house that he simply handed a whole kind of plastic bag full of receipts and said, I'm not going to decide which ones are, are valid. Could you please choose the ones that you think are most appropriate? So it didn't even actually really make the claim. But that does raise another rather eye-popping kind of question. Um, you know, why does that MP who has, have, has, has such a, a large house... You know, why is he, he making that, that... Why is he being paid any kind of expenses? And, and one of the things that I think is interesting about the way the public reacted was the ones that were... that sort of stuck in the gullet were the ones that were extraordinary, like the moat cleaning, yeah. mm -hmm. but also the very ordinary ones got to people. So you still see on the, the IPSA, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority website, where all you now find all the, mm -hmm. the receipts transparently uh, uploaded, uh, the ones that, that the local journalists report on are <laughs> things like, you know, toilet paper and bath plugs and things like that. Because I think there is something confusing for us about MPs. And it's... Well, it's... They're, 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 they're regarded in that very odd way. But just final thoughts here. What's the impact? What's the legacy now? Are, are honourable members still tarnished by this, or even though it's the best part of you know, more than 10 years on? Now, that's interesting because Emma and I had a conversation about this before lunch and... Sadly, we don't think, or I don't think, that necessarily such a scandal couldn't happen again. It wouldn't be about expenses next time. But we're not sure that some of the fundamentals that led to the scandal, the slight inward-lookingness of Parliament, uh, the sense of entitlement that many elected representatives have, that that's necessarily gone away and may have been a factor in public perceptions that led to Brexit and, and, and other things. So maybe um, there is still some learning to be done. Emma? I think the public... I think we citizens also need to learn something. And the reason I got involved in writing this book is that um, actually the story is very different from the way it was portrayed in the media. And um, when people talk about MPs all being venal and uh, power-hungry and lying, it's actually not true. MPs are very, very different. And like any group of people, you have a big, big spectrum uh, of the very honourable ones and the rather dishonourable ones. And so, actually, the legacy, I think, is that they're even more misunderstood than they were. <laughs> So please read our book and see what they're really like. Well, that's the thought to finish with. Uh, Emma Crewe, Andrew Walker, thanks very much for joining us. Thank An you. Extraordinary Scandal, The Westminster Expenses Crisis and Why It Still Matters is published by House. And Book Talk will be back again soon, so do join us then.